Hello, welcome to the Senior Presentation Part 2. Welcome to Virtual Senior Week 2020. Uh, I am happy and excited to go through the college application process. I am Mr. Bruno, the College and Career Counselor here at Round Lake High School. If you watched our first presentation, thank you so much. If you did not, well, welcome to the second part of a two-part presentation. I would recommend going back and watching Part 1, but you can jump in at Part 2. If you are watching this video, that means we are in Monday of Senior Week, and Virtual Senior Week is here. So, a little bit different than previous years, but I think even more exciting, to be honest with you. We have some really cool events planned for this uh, week that we could not do in previous weeks because of limitations of representatives from across uh, from different parts of the state, but we can do some really cool things this year. So, the first thing is... That NACAC virtual college fair that has been being promoted on social media uh, occurred on Sunday, September 13th, and there are going to be multiple more NACAC virtual college fairs coming up. So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail here in a minute. You can sign up for the future NACAC virtual fairs at www.virtualcollegefairs.org. Today is Monday the 14th, so we are in senior presentations. Tuesday the 15th, we're going to be doing a FAFSA information presentation via Zoom. Wednesday the 16th, we're doing a CLC application drive with Claudia Padilla, our CLC navigator. Thursday, we're doing a really cool college panel with our college reps via Zoom as a webinar. And then Friday is Virtual College Palooza. So let's talk more about the week. We will break down each event individually. And just so you know, if you're seeing via Zoom and you're wondering how I get on via Zoom, those links will be sent to you during senior week. So you will be getting a lot of emails um, with information about each of these events. The first event, which occurred on September 13th, and it's going to occur on the 12th, the 18th of October, and then November 8th, is the NACAC Virtual College Fair. During each of the virtual college fairs, more than 600 colleges and university representatives will be available to talk with you and other students. All you have to do is log on to virtualcollegefairs.org using your phone, your iPad, your computer. It's super easy to get around. Select which schools you want to learn more about. You sign up, and then you could be a part of their live interactive sessions. They're going to be talking about they being representatives. They're going to be talking about application processes, financial aid, student life, and much more. You can also schedule a meeting time with a college. You just choose your date and time, and you can have a one-on-one -on -one with the school representative. If you don't know where to start and you're like, whoa, this feels like a lot, don't worry. Each fair has different meetups with information in English and in Spanish, how to find your best college fit, how to pay for college, and more. Plus, there are going to be college counselors available during that process that can also uh, walk through all the information with you if you have any other questions. So... Every event's going to be a little bit differently. There's going to be colleges that may attend the one on the 12th and on the 18th of October and vice versa. There will be a lot of uh, the same schools, but I would recommend attending more than one event if time allows. You really will have a great opportunity to talk with college reps. Don't forget, we will be doing college representative visits in the school via well, virtually through our school day. But there are also opportunities for that. But this is just a really cool way of being able to do an event that normally you'd have to drive to McCormick Place or all the way to the Bradley Center in Wisconsin. But you could do it now from the comfort of your own house. So today is Monday. So we have presentation is out. You are watching this presentation if you're here on this slide. Tomorrow will be the FAFSA information presentation. Tuesday, September 15th at 6 p.m. There will be two presentations, both at 6 p.m., one in English. One Spanish. They're going to be run by our ISAC representatives. Alexis Alvarez is our specific ISAC representative. He will be leading along with Miss Juarez the Spanish event, and I will be leading the English event with our uh, one of our ISAC representative colleagues. So, if you cannot attend the presentation, there will be a recording of both the English and the Spanish presentation. Do not worry; it will be out there. You'll be able to watch it at a later date. We will get that video put up on YouTube and an email will be sent out to families and students. Some of the things we're going to go over as for that event, or ISAC will go over for that event, is what is FAFSA? It's a big process. Getting to know a little bit more about it is going to be super important. What do you need to know before completing the FAFSA? What's an FSA ID? If you don't know what an FSA ID is at this point, don't worry. You will learn it by the end of that uh, 
presentation. And then much, much more. There'll be time at the end for a question and answer segment. So if you have specific questions, please feel free to show up to that event. We will be doing uh, multiple ISAC events throughout the year. This is the first one. So I highly recommend being a part of this if you have the time. Otherwise, again, the video uh, recording of this will be out for you to watch at a later date. Then on the 16th, if you've not applied yet to CLC, we recommend applying to CLC. We recommend every single Brown Lake High School student applying to CLC. If you're thinking, why should I do that? Because it's a wonderful safety net. That is why we call CLC a safety school. It is really an incredible school to uh, be a part of, but it's even more of an incredible safety net. None of us thought we would be here today working from our houses or being in e-learning and being in this environment, but we're here. And CLC is a great way to save a little bit of, a lot of bit of money and to get a lot of your general education course out of the way. If you're looking to get into a major that only requires a two-year associate's degree, you can go to CLC, get through it in two years, and be on your way into your career. If you're looking to go to a traditional four-year college, you can get a lot of your general education courses out of the way at CLC. If you work with a college admission representative, they'll be able to tell you in an academic advisor which courses will go to the school you're thinking about attending in the future. So we really do recommend that every student applies to CLC. So that way, if something does change, or if CLC is your out the, your goal school, which is incredible, and it should be. It's a great school to go to. The application's completed, and you're not scrambling last minute. So on Wednesday the 16th, Claudia will be available all day the whole school day to help students get through the application process. All you need to do is sign up at her Calendly link here that you can see on the screen. Um, and I will be sending this out in an email for you also to make it even easier for you to be able to click and move on. All you need to do is sign up for a 30-minute meeting with Claudia. It will not take 30 minutes to get through the application, but if you have any questions, she'll be able to help you with some questions too. Get through that application, apply, ask a few questions, and be on your way. Claudia will be available all day that day. Make sure you have your social security number available. From this point forward, your social security number is going to be very, very important. You will need it for applying for um, a credit card, a loan, a car, a house, if you're buying a house. You'll need it for most jobs you go to are going to ask, or almost all jobs will ask for your social security number when um, getting through that application or getting to that onboarding stages. So make sure you have your social security number ready. You cannot complete this application without your social security number. So if you're thinking to yourself, I don't know it, or I don't know if I have one, or I don't have one, that's okay. I would still schedule an appointment with Claudia, and she'll be able to walk you through what next steps look like. And then on Thursday, I'm excited for every single event during College Palooza. This is an event that I am particularly excited about because it is a three-part series a part happening in each month. This is the first part to our virtual college representative panel, um, and it's going to be really cool. So we have representatives from University of Illinois Springfield, College of Lake County, Aurora University, University of Wisconsin Whitewater, and Northern Illinois University, who are all going to be on a webinar together in a panel format. They're going to spend five to ten minutes talking about their school and why you should go there and some cool like, tips and tricks about their school. And then after that, we are going to open up a question and answer segment for students and families to be able to uh, ask any questions they have uh, about the school to the college representatives, and they will be there to answer it. The reason it is a three-part series is because so many schools were interested in participating that we could not get every school into one event. So we will be doing this on the 17th, and then we will be having an event in October and an event in November with all different college reps at every single event. The idea is for you as students or families to hear about small private schools, community colleges, large public schools, and all those in between. And so you're going to get really a nice mixture of college representatives and colleges and universities that they're representing during this panel. This panel is going to be open to all of the schools around us, not just Round Lake. So make sure you get there and you get in for the event. We have a lot of seats available but we want to have as many people as possible. The more people that show up to these events makes it so much easier for me, Mr. Bruno, to reach out to colleges and say, hey, do you want to try another cool event with us at Round Lake High School? Um, if we have a lot of people showing up, they're going to be really excited to take part in it. So I am super, super excited about this event. I hope that lots of families and lots of students show up to this. And then Friday, 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 we have College Palooza. It is our seventh annual College Palooza. It is a Big event at Round Lake High School. We do it every year. Well, we do it every year for the last seven years. 
uh, every year <laughs> during the end of senior week. It is how we put a cherry on top of that senior week for you. So this week, uh, it will be done virtually via Zoom. It's going to be from first period all the way to fifth period or to 5 p.m. It's a long day, but we are going to be there to make sure we help students in an open Zoom forum where all of the Round Lake counselors will be. Um, once you are inside of the Zoom, if you have specific questions, then you can do a breakout session with your counselor or another counselor or myself. We will all be on hand to help you uh, with applications virtually. We'll help you if you've started your personal essay. We can help you proofread it or we can give you ideas about what to write about, although we are going to go really in detail about that during this presentation. We can also help you fill out fee waivers if you have fee waivers already ready to be sent in, transcripts, and much, much more. A link to the Zoom will be sent to all of the Round Lake High School seniors before the event begins. A few minutes ago, I talked about uh, how you can go to the NACAC virtual fair, but if you do not have time to attend one of those, we have a lot of college representatives that are going to attend Round Lake High School in a virtual format this year. Last year, we had students that just came to the College and Career Resource Center to sit down with these representatives, which was really nice, but that's not possible this year. So with a lot of um, creativity and a little uh, push and passion from myself and my college representatives' uh, peers, we figured out some ways to make it work. So what students need to do is scan that QR code with a dinosaur on the right of this photo with your iPad or your iPhone, and it will take you to a Google form. The Google form will have all of the representatives that are scheduled to be coming up. Sign up to take part in it. You need to make sure you're signed up at least 24 hours in advance for the uh, Zoom session with the college representatives, so that way I can send you the link to the Zoom. And then make sure that you are not missing classes. If you talk to your teacher ahead of time and your teacher approves you not being in class virtually in order to attend, that is fine as long as you have the approval of your teacher. Again, 24 hours ahead of time. I update the uh, college representative list often, sometimes two or three times a day. We have, at this point, 25 schools and we also have military representatives or military recruiters on there. So make sure you're checking back constantly. I would check back every day, every other day, to see if there's schools that you're passionate about meeting with and then sign up to be a part of it. When you are meeting with these college representatives, you are representing Round Lake High School, you're representing yourself, you're representing your whole community. So make sure you are dressed appropriately, you're asking great questions, you're paying attention, you're being diligent. If you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to Mr. Bruno. I sent out a super long email uh, at the beginning of last week about these panels and with the link to make it easier for you to sign up. If you need me to send it to you again, shoot me an email. Now that we've gotten through some of the housekeeping, let's talk about applications. This is why you're here. This is the bread and butter for this. So let's talk about applications. So this is a step-by-step -step guide to the college admissions process. We are going to go through um, beginning to end for the college admissions uh, process, especially when it comes to applications and everything that's going to go into the application. We talked about in the first presentation, if you did not watch the first presentation, again, I recommend going back because we talk about the college search. So at this point, we're assuming you've made it through the college search process and you're in the application process. So what we talked about in step one and step two in presentation one was figuring out what you're looking for in a college. Do a college search and create a list of colleges that fit what you're looking for. We're now in the application step. So we're now in step three and four. Fill out the application for admission. Determine what supplemental materials are required to be included and how they should be sent. And then in the future, you're going to be checking your emails, your texts, your voicemails, your student portal to make sure you're getting all of that super important information, not just from myself or your my, my career counselor peers or from other representatives from outside of the school. Uh, you want to make sure you're just checking in for everybody. And then step six, don't forget to fill out your FAFSA if you're eligible, and that begins in October, and to add colleges to your FAFSA. Step seven is follow up with an admission rep or your counselor if you still have questions or unsure of next steps. And step eight, be competent and stay positive. This is a very long journey, and it's not always the easiest journey, but it is super doable, and with help from us, and with a lot of like confidence and positivity, you'll be able to get through it. You'll look back and six or eight months from now and be like, I got through it. I made it from one side to the other side and I feel much better for being here now. All right, true or false time. 
It's pretty easy since the answer is directly in the middle of the screen for you. But true or false, college applications are super hard and super scary. False. It may feel overwhelming, and I, I know it does, but it comes down to knowing the types of applications and the parts of applications. If you can get all of these tips and tricks before going in, you're going to feel much more confident uh, making your way through this process. So we are going to get you that information. It's like when you're doing an escape room and you have those three tips and tricks that you can like push the button for a clue and those three clues really get you further along. Well, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of clues to get you to the end of this escape room known as applying to colleges. So what are some types of applications? Let's talk about the ones on the left of the screen first, and then we'll talk about early decision. So regular decision is uh, students submit an application by a specified date and receive a decision in a clearly stated period of time. So regular decision typically is January 1, January 15th. Those are when the deadlines are. You'll have applied by that date. You'll have all of your information in, and then you will wait until you get your letter of uh, acceptance, or you'll hopefully not a denial letter, but hopefully an acceptance letter. Those could come anytime before May 1st. The school typically tells you when to expect it, but that January application deadline typically means you'll hear back March, April, May. Then there's early action. We're going to jump over rolling admission, but we will get back to it. Then there's early action. That's when students apply by a Earlier date and early application deadlines, typically November 1st, sometimes November 15th. You get that in and you are viewed by the colleges in a different group of students. You're seen earlier than the other students, your applications, and you typically hear back from the college about being admitted or by being denied much earlier than your peers who apply in regular decision. Traditionally, if you apply by November 1st or November 15th, you'll hear back come January or uh, February. You'll hear about uh, if you've been into the, if you've been accepted to the school or not, which is awesome because it's really nice to know going into like February and March and spring break if you've been accepted to your dream school, or if you need to get back on that application process. Rolling admissions is when an institution reviews applications as they're submitted and then renders an admissions decision throughout the admissions cycle. What that means is, and a lot of schools do rolling admissions. You'll see a lot of smaller schools doing rolling admissions. Uh, you apply on Tuesday, and then in four to six weeks, you hear back from the school if you've been admitted or not. Uh, that can change the time frame. A lot of schools say four to six weeks. If you're applying when they don't have a ton of applications in, you may hear back in a few days. If you're applying when it's super busy, you may hear back at the end of those six weeks. Schools like to say four to six weeks because they don't want you to email them a week later thinking, or even not even email them, but in your head, start freaking out that you weren't accepted. They want to give you that window of time. These are all considered non-restrictive applications because you're not signing any legally binding contracts to apply. You're just applying. When you apply with early decision, you're, set, you're filling out a legally binding contract. Counselors in general, especially counselors that are around like high school, um, want you to be very, 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 very sure if you are going to be applying early decision. Early action, EA, think about the grade. A, it's great, great, awesome. A, go. Early decision is like, do not proceed. E, do not proceed. So if it is a school that you have been dreaming about going to your entire life, and if you were admitted, you would 100% go there, then early decision is something that I still want you to talk to your counselor about because you're going into a legally binding contract. It is not for the faint of heart. It is something that you really need to make sure you want to do before you uh, move forward. A lot of the times, early decision requires a counselor sign-off, so you will be talking to your counselor about that anyways. QuestBridge is another restrictive application. It is a program where they match you to colleges that you've been thinking about, and then you could get a full ride. If it is uh, September 13th, 14th, 15th, and you are just thinking about QuestBridge, it is probably too late. It's a process that starts many, many years earlier through QuestBridge, and they would have reached out and you would know about it. So we will not spend too much time on QuestBridge. What are some types of applications? So there's uh, three major types of applications. There's school-specific applications, there's system applications, and then there's the common applications. So school-specific are websites, like you go directly through the school to apply on their website. That's something like College of Lake County, National Lewis, Northern Illinois. You just go directly to their website, you push click to apply now, you fill out all the information through their website, 
and you have completed it. System applications are where an entire system of schools all are on one website. So all the schools in the University of Wisconsin system are on their University of Wisconsin system website. University of California has a full system where you apply to the school that you want to through that system. And then there's common applications, which are big databases where you can apply to multiple schools. Um, it requires more, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But some of those are the Common Application, the Common Black College Application, Universal Application, and Coalition Application. It's important to determine what schools you're applying to to see if overall if it offers more than one type of application. Don't do extra work. If you're only applying to CLC or you're thinking, I just want to apply to CLC in Northern, fill out the specific applications. Don't go in and complete the Common App. If you're thinking about applying to two or three schools on the Common App, then it's super important that you put all your information to the Common App. It will make your life significantly easier in the long run. So what is the Common App? Mr. Bruno, you keep saying the Common App, but I don't even know what it is. So let's talk about it. The Common App is a college application system shared by member colleges. There's 800 plus colleges on the Common App, and it continues to grow every day. Member colleges accept this application from prospective students that come through the Common App. So instead of filling out multiple applications for each school, all you do is fill out the Common application once, and then you send it to whatever college you want to apply to that will accept it that's in their database. However, this does not mean you can apply to dozens of schools with the click of a button. Many colleges have additional supplements that you'll have to submit. There are forms with additional questions and sometimes an additional extra essay. There will be a step-by-step -step guide for applying to the Common App that's going to be available for all Round Lake High School seniors. It will be sent out to you by me, Mr. Bruno. It should come in the email about this uh, presentation that I'm sending out to you today. So if you're looking at this right now, you should have the step-by-step -step for you right now. There's a lot of questions, but this guide will get you through it much easier. So some schools just in Illinois and Wisconsin that are on the Common App, um, if you see a school you've been thinking of that's on the Common App, uh, shoot up on the screen here for you, then you know where you're going to be applying. Some big ones, University of Chicago, which is one of the hardest schools in the entire country, in the entire world to get into, and we'll talk about it in a little bit here. University of Illinois, Chicago, my alma mater, which is a school that I love and highly recommend. Schools like Bradley, uh, Illinois Westland, Lake Forest, which is really close to our, to our campus, are all on here in Illinois. And then some schools in Wisconsin, Beloit, Carroll, Carthage, Ripon, St. Norbert, um, all on this common app also. Then there's the coalition application, which is very similar to the Common App, same systematically, uh, just a different tool. And if you look back on this page, you see University of Illinois at Chicago, but you don't see University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. It is because they are on the coalition application. So of this list of schools on the right side of your screen, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is probably the one that the majority of our students uh, will apply to on that list. The other schools are incredible schools. Um, all of those schools are really great schools on that list, um, but we see a lot of kids going to University of Illinois or Urbana-Champaign or at least applying to that school. So here's some things that could be included in a college application now that we've talked about different types of applications and different systems of applications. What would be in the application itself? What do I need for the application? Well, the application form itself is going to ask you a lot of information about your personal life and your educational data. So it's going to ask you name, uh, email, phone number, address, date of birth. It's going to ask you your social security number. It's going to ask about your parents, your family, your guardians. It's going to ask about um, all of your courses. It's going to ask a lot about, in the Common App, it's going to ask you about grades and courses you've taken. It's also going to ask you about honors, awards, activities, employment. If you have a resume built, um, that's going to be a really great tool for you to go back to and type in a lot of information on these uh, applications from. If you don't have a resume, that's okay. Now may be the time to start a resume, but it's definitely a time for you to grab out a piece of paper and start listing all those awards, those honors, those activities, and the employment community service down. If you've participated in anything through the last four years of high school, not middle school, high school, Get it written down. Write down when you did it, how many hours you think you participated there, and some major things you did with the club or activity or uh, sport or employment. So that way when it's asking you um, your major areas of like 
it's going to ask you, like, what did you do? Then you have little notes. If you just do this off the top of your head, you will surely miss some things you have done. And it is much easier just to have it all written down. So if something pops up tomorrow in your mind, you can write it down on that sheet. And then you can get it onto the Common App or you can get it into the System App. Schools are going to really be looking at this now that we're going much more test optional as a country. This is going to be important for you. And then essay or essays, because you may have to write more than one. Not every school requires this. Like if you apply to College of Lake County, you're not applying with an essay. But a lot of schools will require you to have a personal essay and then some supplemental essays. And we will talk more about that. Some other things that are going to be required for a college app will be official transcripts, standardized test scores, secondary school report, counselor recommendation, mid-year report form, teacher recommendations. Those last three are not all required by colleges, but some will require it, and they'll require it through the Common or the Coalition app. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. What are some other parts of the application? Or here's some parts we talked about also, but we're going to get more into detail about. We'll talk about transcript requests, test scores, personal statements, letters of recommendation, and application fee waivers. So let's talk about college applications. How about transcripts? So most colleges, well, I would say the majority, require applicants to send official transcripts directly from the high school. So how does a student request a transcript to be sent officially? You will send it through SCORE, or I will send it through SCORE, or your counselor will send it through SCORE, but you will request it through SCORE. Some colleges will send transcript requests directly to the counselor electronically. Um, so there are some schools where you don't need to make the request to the counselor for it to be sent, but the majority of the schools you will need to request through SCORE to get your transcript sent over. So there will be a step-by-step -step for you coming shortly on how to request transcripts through SCORE. Test scores. Now, you're thinking to yourself, why are you talking about test scores, Mr. Bruno? We did not take the SAT last year, and I don't know anything about it yet. Well, you are not alone. We also still do not have the information about what's going on with the SAT, but I think it would be a disservice to everybody if I did not talk about what test scores look like during the college application process in case we do have testing dates. And I would um, assume and I would move forward with the idea that we will have an SAT eventually that will be taken by all of our seniors this year. Um, and so I want to get you that information now about what it could look like if you're applying so you're not too far ahead should we move forward and should you want to put your test scores on there. Uh, Round Lake High School does not include test scores on the transcript. For the SAT, you may specify up to four colleges when you take the SAT that you want to receive your scores as part of your registration. However, if you register with a fee waiver, you get unlimited scores to send for free. All Round Lake High School students are eligible for a fee waiver through uh, not only the application process, but also for the SAT. So make sure you are reaching out to Mr. Bruno or to your counselor to get a fee waiver. Once you get a fee waiver logged into your College Board account, you can log in any time and order test scores. If you take the test multiple times, you can send multiple test scores to multiple schools for free. Traditionally, it's about $12 to send a test score through SAT. Do not spend that money. Save that $12 for something delicious or treat yourself or put it towards a cell phone bill. Do not spend that $12 to send your SAT scores. But remember, Scores are not received by the college instantly. It's not like you send it and it's in the school's mailbox. It does take about one to two weeks, so plan accordingly. So what kind of test scores can you submit? What are schools looking for when you're submitting test scores? So if we do move forward or if you have taken the SAT, you can choose to submit test scores from a specific testing date or you can submit all your scores to a school. Some selective schools are going to require you to send all of your scores so they want to see the good and the bad and everything in between. Other colleges will combine your highest subscores from multiple tests to um, compute a higher composite score known as a super score. So let's break that down for you. You take a test in uh, August and you get a really high English score and then you take a test in September and you get a really high math score. Well, that school will take your highest English, your highest science, put them together, and give you a new score based on the two highest scores together, which is super exciting. That's why this little girl is so psyched, because it is very exciting to have that super score. Um, all colleges will use the highest scores when reviewing your application. So 
even the schools that want to see all of your scores, they're still going to use your highest score when they're um, reviewing the application. They just want to see what it's been like on your actual SAT journey. Again, um, we n very few of you have an SAT score, and that is okay this year as schools are becoming much, much more lenient with test optional. But I wanted you guys to know about this in case we do move forward. But I also want to talk about test optional a little bit also. So many colleges are going test optional. Many more are going test optional now than ever. And what this means is you're not required to submit your test score as part of your application. Most of the time, if you choose not to submit your score, the school will want you to prove your readiness in some other ways. So here is what most schools are thinking about or they're giving more uh, weight on now. So we're calling it, or they're calling it, or everybody's calling it a holistic process. So instead of just being based on your courses and your grades and your standardized test score, what schools are looking for now are your grades, the rigor of your courses or the kind of courses you've taken and the trajectory of your courses, but also extracurricular activities, sports, clubs, community service, your job. They're also looking at honors, awards, distinctions. All these areas now are weighted a little bit heavier to make up for that testing piece. So this really is pretty incredible for students that are great students and that are active students that may not do great on standardized testing you're not being held to a standard of just that score anymore. They're really taking into account all of who you are as a student. It's also great for students that are wonderful at SATs or at the ACT because if you have the opportunity to take the test and you do really, really well on it, you can still send the score. They're not saying it's test no or it's test yes. It's optional. You get the choice to send it through. So if you're a yes on the test or a no on the test, that's great. And if you're the third, if you're a maybe and you don't know, like, sh is the school test optional? Should I send my test score in? What do you think? Reach out to your counselor or myself in order to talk to you about the process. We're happy to help. We can also get you in contact with the college representative that you're thinking about attending to give you some more information. So always ask the question if you have a question. What about the personal statement in the essay? What does that look like? Well, they're different, and every single school is going to have a little bit different um, process. You're going to see a lot of the schools, your personal statement's going to be the exact same. They want to know about you as a person. They want to know about like what makes you unique, what makes you special, what makes you you. Um, and then those supplemental essays are going to be quite different, and we'll talk more about supplemental essays in a few minutes. Some really important things to know and to think about and to follow are the directions. Answer the question that's asked or write about what they're looking for. If they're asking you about the best day of your life, don't write about the worst day of your life. If they're asking you about the worst day of your life, don't tell them about the best day of your life. Follow the question. Write about what they're asking you for. Stick to the word limit. If the word limit is a thousand words, and usually it's between 150 and 650 words, don't go to 2,000 words because if you get to the really, really good stuff at the 12, 000, the 1,200 word mark, they're not going to read anymore. College admission counselors have told me year after year after year they will stop reading at the word limit because that's what they're supposed to do. So if they're asking you to write a 650 word uh, essay, don't write more than that. And make sure you're using correct grammar, punctuation, and you're having somebody proofread it and somebody else proofread it and then you proofread it because this is the school's opportunity to get to know you through your writing and who you are and what makes you unique. And if the thing that makes you unique is that you can't spell or you have bad grammar, that, that, that doesn't mean that you're not great enough to get into the school. But what it says to the school is that you didn't even think about having somebody proofread it for you. Uh, nobody, I mean, there, I'm sure there's some people that are the best grammatical and they have the best spelling and the best punctuation. That doesn't have to be you. You just need to have a few other people look at your application to get it where it needs to be. You do not want to send an application with a bunch of errors on it. That is something that's going to stand out also. Don't let that be the thing that stands out. Let you be the thing that stands out because you are a standout. So the Dean of Admissions from MIT is going to talk about um, some advice about getting about the essay. The best advice that I would give to any student writing an essay is to, number one, answer the question that is asked. That's generally important. 
and do it as honestly and as personally as they can. So don't try to be somebody else and don't have anybody else's voice shine through on your essay. Just be yourself in your own voice. Tell us the answer to the question. That's all we want to know. Pretty simple. Be yourself. They want to know who you are. They're not looking to find out about your cousin or your best friend or your friend's friend's friend. They want to know who you are. Why are you the student they want to accept into their college? Why are you the person they want to bring into their campus and to represent them as a school? What makes you stand out? It's really important that you're, you're showing who you are. So we're going to hear from a few different colleges um, about writing a strong college admissions essay. Let's hear what they have to say. First and foremost, when looking at essay, you're going to be looking at things like their ability to write well and their preparation for college. But we're also using that information to kind of see things like their resilience and um, their love of learning and their intellectual curiosity. I always tell a student, you know, if you had the chance to come meet with the admissions com committee and present yourself in person, would you want to do it? And without fail, students say, yeah, I'd love to have that opportunity. And when I ask why, they say because if they were able to get to know the admissions committee, the admissions committee would want to admit them because they would know them and they would get to know what they're about and what makes them unique and special. The essay is really neat in that it's one of the only places in the application where they have complete control, where they can write about the things that they've been involved in, the things that they've done. One piece of advice I would give to every student is to ask someone who knows them a little bit um, to read their essay and to tell them what impressions they have of you after reading the essay. I think the essays that work best are actually quite simple. I think students get really caught up in thinking that this, this essay has to encompass your entire life and it has to be groundbreaking and you know publishable quality. Um, and that's a lot to ask of a high school student. So I always advise students to stick to the simple things that you know. Um, and the, the essays that stand out the most in my mind are about simple, simple things, very everyday uh, topics. I have seen some amazing essays about things like students walking their dog, or, or even their bus ride to school. I think our hope is that if a student were to drop the essay on the floor of their high school and someone were to pick it up, it didn't have your name on it, that they'd say for sure, oh, I know that this is so-and-so's essay because it speaks so much about your voice and your experiences and your perspective. I think my favorite essay that I've ever read came from a student in the Midwest, and he wrote about working at a fast food restaurant. And he wrote about how people were treating him as they went to the drive-thru and how he was treating them back. He called himself an undercover anthropologist, which admittedly was a little nerdy in a brown sort of way, but I liked his essay because I was able to see what he was seeing and feel what he was feeling. So for the purposes of the application where we as admission officers are trying to get to know the applicant, that's a great essay. Tons of super important information on there, and you can rewatch that over and over again if you want to. I think the biggest call out for me would be when the admission advisor from Georgetown said, you should be able to drop your essay on the floor, somebody pick it up and know exactly who it is, because that's what you're looking for. You're looking to show who you are um, in a brief, concise manner. So you want to show how great you are or what makes you stand out or what makes you unique through this essay. So let's talk about the University of Chicago. I told earlier that they were one of the best countries, or one of the best schools in the entire United States, in the world even, and that's true. So while most schools have your personal essay, the University of Chicago also does these really fun essay prompts every year, which gives students another chance to show who they are in a very unique way. They are out there, and they are... Um, really there to allow students to show exactly who they are. They can be witty, they can be smart, they can be super creative, they can be a mixture of all of those things. And so some of the questions they asked this year to students applying to the University of Chicago is, a hot dog might be a sandwich and cereal might be soup, but a blank is a blank? What's so odd about odd numbers? Have you ever walked through the aisles of a warehouse store like a Costco or a Sam's Club and wondered, who would buy a jar of mustard a foot and a half tall? Well, we bought it, but it didn't stop us from wondering about other things, like absurd eating contests, impulse buys, excess, unimagined uses for mustard, storage, preservatives, notions of bigness, 
and dozens of other ideas, both silly and serious. Write an essay somehow inspired by super huge mustard. Where's Waldo? Really? And finally, find X. That's it. That's the whole essay prompt. Find X. You get to do as a student whatever you want to get from the beginning of your essay to X at the end, which is super, super creative. And it allows you um, a lot of leeway to show who you are. Of course, not every school is going to be this, this intense. It's the University of Chicago. This is just some fun ideas. And if you're looking to like get your brainstorming and your brain moving, uh, this is some fun things to just kind of test out. So letters of recommendation. This is another part of your... Uh, application process that's pretty important especially now if we're not sending test scores or you're going test optional letters of recommendation are going to have a lot more weight not every school is going to require a letter of recommendation uh, some schools are going to require one or two so you should stick to sending one or two if a school is asking for a certain amount don't send them more than the amount or they're not going to read them all if a school is optional only send them one maybe two really good ones What's a really good letter of recommendation, Mr. Bruno? Well, it's a teacher in a core academic subject, a class related to your career or major interest that knows you well, preferably from junior or senior year. The reason why is you have come a very long way since your freshman year. If you were in freshman English and you have not seen your freshman English teacher at all until you send them that email or send them a Zoom link to talk to them about writing a recommendation letter, you're not the same person you were freshman year. A lot has changed. You've matured. You've grown up. A lot's going to change in the next four years. Asking somebody who knows you today or who knows you more recently, like your junior year, to write you that letter of recommendation uh, holds a lot more weight for those who are reading it. And the reason you want it to come from your, preferably from your career or major interest area, is because that teacher it has the ability to talk about who you are in their class. Ask the teacher, uh, traditionally in person, but now we're going to be doing it via Zoom, if they can honestly give you a positive recommendation. If they say yes, tell them you'll fill out the letter of recommendation request form and let them have it ASAP. You will have the opportunity to download the letter of recommendation request form. I will send it out in an email, and you can use that form to... Uh, Give the teachers some guidance, or some ideas, and some call-outs about who you are, and we will talk more about that in just a few moments. Some other things for the letter of recommendation is you can ask one teacher to provide multiple letters of recommendation. Make sure you give them a list of the colleges that you need recommendations for, their due dates, and then make sure the teacher knows if it's in the Common App or the Coalition, how they're supposed to get those letters of recommendations over. Colleges look favorably on students who waive the right to review. So what that means is if a student waives the right to review, that means that the student is allowing the teacher or the counselor to send the recommendation to the college without the student being able to see that first. It holds a lot more weight because what it says to a college admissions advisor is you are so confident in what that teacher is going to write that you don't need to read it before they send it over. And that just says that... Um, you truly believe in yourself and the teacher and the relationship you've built and who you are as a student. So my recommendation, and you can follow it or choose not to follow it, would be if they're asking you to waive the right to review to say, yes, you do waive the right to review. You still can technically see the letter of recommendation. The teacher could send you an email later or after if you want to read it so you can read it. But it just means that it's like a closed sealed envelope. You didn't get to see what was on that letter of recommendation before it was sent out. You need to give at least 15 school days for a teacher or a counselor to write the letter of recommendation. You are not the only student that's asking for a letter of recommendation. Hundreds upon hundreds of students are going to be asking for letters of recommendation. Maybe not from all the same person, but even five or six letters of recommendation take hours upon hours to complete. You do not want your teacher filling out a form field recommendation letter, and you will hear very soon from some college admission advisors about why you don't want that. And then send a thank you note to the teacher when the application process is over. You don't need to send a card in the mail, but an email or a shout out on a Zoom or a quick uh, voicemail message on their voicemail box goes a really long way. Your teacher is writing these letter of recommendations in their own time, outside of the building, outside of the workday, and they're doing it because they care about you and they believe in you and they want schools or scholarships to know that they're giving your, their seal of approval on you. So a thank you note goes a very long way. A quick email saying, 
Thank you so much for taking the time to write this letter of recommendation. It really means a lot to me, and it's going to help me in my process of getting to the next step. goes a long way. So you will see over the span of your lifetime, especially when you get into a business or into a job, that people that are appreciated just in general are happier and they go further and they're willing to do more for you. So start that process down. Let your teacher know how appreciative you are that they gave their time or your counselor, how appreciative you are of their time for being able to to do this for you. So let's hear about some elements of a strong letter of recommendation from multiple college admissions advisors. So when we're reading a recommendation letter, what we're looking for is what, what kind of presence you are in a classroom. And that's very important to us because ultimately what a university is, is it's a lot of classrooms. It's a lot of people looking to discover new knowledge. Teachers that can give anecdotes about a student in the classroom can be really helpful because we're trying to imagine this student in our classroom. And we're wondering if this is a student that always is speaking up and always raising their hand you know, the person, the student that the teacher would ask to watch the class if they had to leave the room for a minute, or if this is a student who's fairly quiet and only speaks once in a while, but when that student speaks, it kind of turns the conversation on its head. What I recommend uh, for students to do, and for you to do in this process, would be to sit down with that teacher and maybe even give them four or five bullet points of, you know, why you wanted them to write your letter of recommendation. Remind them what you did in their class, right? So love the, the, the group work. That was a real favorite of mine. I felt like that really gave me a chance to do some teaching in the class as well as learning. Or that paper that I wrote on Twain, James, and Howell I felt was a good you know, representation of my writing ability. Or you know, I really felt like that group project that we had to do you know, allowed me to both be a participant but also a leader. You know, and really, again, remind them of what you did in the class so they can write a much more personalized letter. The last thing in the world you want to get is sort of a template sort of a letter where you know, they're sort of plugging in things about good student, we, you know, always gets the work done, works hard. The biggest thing we see with recommendation is what we call the template recommendation, which is basically a very kind of form recommendation, and all they need to do is kind of take out the names, the activities, you know, some of the um, personal attributes and replace them in order to describe one person but also describing 20 people. So to really help your teachers write a terrific letter of recommendation that doesn't look like a template, uh, you really want to get specific with those examples. You know, really let them know who you are, remind them who you were in their classroom, because basically admissions officers, they like those anecdotes. They like the specificity. That's really going to help them you know, understand you in the context of that classroom. Another thing that I look for a lot in recommendations is something I call separating. So is your teacher saying, this is a top student in 10 years? Are they separating you from the group? Or are they saying, this is a, this is a good student? Both of those are fine, but you know, one does suggest that um, you are doing something extraordinary in the classroom that's making you stand out from the crowd. So some, again, really, really great and important pieces of knowledge throughout that. So when you fill out the form to send to your teachers for the letter of recommendation, or if you just want to send something to your teacher one-on-one, -on -one, it's going to be basically a brag sheet. So if you've ever been in a sport or if you've um, ever applied for any kind of scholarship yet at this point, um, bragging about yourself is important. It's a humble brag. It's not like a traditional brag. It's a humble brag. You are going to let your teacher know about some of the most important things you've done in their class so it sparks their memories and it gives them some great things to write in there. You heard the gentleman uh, speaking about how telling them about, oh, do you remember that great paper I wrote? Or do you remember that small group that I was a part of where I got to be a, a leader and I really shined during that process? You want to put a few of those into an email or fill out the letter of recommendation form to let your teacher know. So that way when your teacher's writing your recommendation or your counselor's writing your letter of recommendation or even your coach is writing your letter of recommendation, they have some real life experiences they can put in there. I'm sure that they know a lot of the things you've done. But when they're writing um, thousands and thousands of letters of recommendation through the time through their entire career, um, it helps to have those just right in front of them. You want to stay away from getting a form email from a teacher or a counselor or a coach. So the more you can give them specific standout moments, the more that they can write about. Hence the humble brag. Now, what about this application fee waiver thing, Mr. Bruno? People have been talking to me about it, and I don't know what they're talking about. 
All Round Lake students qualify for a fee waiver. Because we are a Title I school, we're on free and reduced lunch, and you have SAT waivers, you're all eligible for a fee waiver. You must see your counselor or me specific. I would say to come to Mr. Bruno, send an email, set up a Calendly Zoom. We'll talk about that in a little bit to complete the fee waiver after you submitted your application or when you can proceed no further in the application process without paying. Some schools, you need to have the payment process before you can finish. Um, if that is the case, I will help you get through that part. And a lot of schools, you just process the application and then they look for a payment later. The reason that we complete this fee waiver is so you do not need to put that payment in. There are schools where application fees are all the way up to $150. There's a lot of things you can do with that money. If you're applying to five schools and all the schools are 50 bucks to apply each, that's $250 that you can put towards books or towards credits for next year. Uh, don't pay to apply to schools. This is true for 95% of colleges. There's very few schools that do not accept fee waivers, and I am happy to be the one that tells you if they do or they do not. I will reach out to all the schools to see if there's anything they can do. Make sure you see a counselor first. Do not pay to apply to a college. Um, just don't save the money. Put it to more important things than paying for uh, applying for schools. Not every school gets this luxury. A lot of schools, they have to pay to apply their students. We have this gift of not having to pay to apply to a vast majority of colleges. So reach out to me or your counselor, and we'll be able to help you with that process. Specifically, on the Co Coalition app or on the Common app, students can determine their eligibility for a fee waiver by answering a brief series of questions while creating their profile. If you qualify um, from College Board, you'll automatically bypass the payment screen when you submit it. Same on the Common app, uh, your high school counselor will be asked to verify. And then for other colleges that participate, you're going to come to Mr. Bruno or your counselor and we'll help you fill out the NACAC form or the College Board form virtually and we'll send it in for you. Some things to remember um, overall, most colleges require that all parts of the application, fee waiver, personal statement, test scores, transcripts, letters of recommendation, and anything else be received by the deadline for the application to be considered complete. Failure to request these items early enough will mean that you won't make the deadline. Here's an example. This year specifically, traditionally it's November 1st, but this year due to COVID, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign's deadline is November 15th. You do not want to wait until October 31st to start working on your personal statements because that's going to give you less than, it's going to give you about two weeks to not only complete an internal personal essay, but get it edited, get it proofread, get it edited again, and now you're also asking for letters of recommendation, transcript requests, fee waivers. That's too much to do in two weeks. It's, it's a very short period of time. If we're telling you to give 15 days for a letter of recommendation, you don't want to ask exactly 15 days ahead of time. Start the process today. If you do it in small chunks, you will get through this college application process so much easier and you will feel so much better about it. You can... At University of Illinois Champaign, if you send them four or five parts by November 15th and you send them that fifth part on November 17th, they're going to move you from early action to regular decision and you will not be uh, you will not be admitted during the early action phase. You'll go down to a regular decision student, which if that's okay with you, fine. But you did all this work to get it in by November 15th. You just missed one piece. You could get to that. You could get all five pieces in if you start early enough. Now what? Now what are we supposed to do? We've completed this application. Keep checking your email, your voicemail. Uh, keep checking Infinite Campus. We're going to send you information. Respond to any requests made from your email, your voicemail, your regular mail uh, in a timely manner. If you're applying to schools and they need a few extra pieces of information, you need to get it to them in a short period of time or in the amount of time that they told you they need it by in order for them to process forward. If they're telling you they need uh, a mid-year transcript sent in order to accept you, then you need to ask me or your counselor for a mid-year transcript. Otherwise, they're not going to move forward with that acceptance. So this is the time to be really, really, really great at checking all of your forms of communication, email, mail, voicemail, portal, all of those things. And then when you're done and you've applied to all of your schools and there's no more school applications to apply for, relax. If you did the best you could on your application, it's out of your hands now and it's into the hands of your 
college representative. It's in their hands now. It's the admission advisor's hands to decide. Remember, have an open line of communication with your counselor. Let us know where you are in your journey. If we can uh, monitor and help you through the process, then we and we know where you are in the process, it makes it easier for us to have those conversations. It might feel scary right now, and it might feel overwhelming, but if you look at the application process in pieces, instead of a large, scary thing, you'll be able to tackle it. Make sure you're giving yourself plenty of time. It's like a piece of IKEA furniture. While you have instructions, they may not be the easiest to understand instructions, but imagine if you had a piece of IKEA furniture and you had the person that designed it and created it in your house with you. That's what your counselors are. That's what your teachers are. That's what your friends who have gone through this process are. They are the people that can help you with those instructions, but you have to do it step by step. You have to take the items out of the box. You have to look at the application. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's a process. You, you should do it in small parts to get to the final step and the final stage, which is the submit button, instead of doing everything in one day. Give yourself time. If you're doing a lot of things in a short period of time, it becomes stressful. Give yourself plenty of time. Be honest. Don't over-exaggerate about yourself, but also don't undersell yourself. A lot of students have really awesome stories, and they're going to tell those awesome stories. So when you brag, humble brag. Make sure schools know about all the things you've done. Make sure they know that you've been involved in multiple activities. You have awesome grades. You've been an amazing member of the community. You help raise your siblings. You're an important part of your family. If they're asking the question, don't undersell yourself. Don't make things up. But don't undersell yourself. You want to make sure people know and schools know how great you are. And if you have questions, ask for help. I said it multiple times. I'll say it again. Ask for help. Now what? What else can I do? Practice self-care. Make sure you're taking care of yourself. Make sure you're checking in with yourself. Make sure you're not so stressed that you can't. You, you don't feel like you can move on. Small breathing techniques go far away. Breathe in, count to five, breathe out, count to five in your head. These are huge things. Self-care is going to be super important. If you've applied to two or three schools and your version of self-care is eating a half a pint of Ben & Jerry's ice cream, buy yourself a pint of Ben & Jerry's ice cream with that money you saved from the application fee and eat half a pint when you filled out two applications. Treat yourself. You deserve it. You've gotten through this process. It's huge. Some things you can do right now, attend all the events for Senior Week. There's all of these, all these tools, all this information, all of these things that you can be participating in for free from the comfort of your home. Participate in them. It, I would hate for you to look back and be like, man, I regret not being a part of all of these activities when they're here and they're right in front of you. Keep attending college fairs. Keep attending rep visits. All the college fairs coming up are October 12th, October 18th, November 8th. They're free to attend. Participate if you can. Talk to friends, family, teachers, counselors, whoever you feel comfortable talking with about this journey. Tell them the good. Tell them the bad. Tell them you're struggling. Tell them you need help. Use your resources because you have a lot of resources. There's a lot of people here for you that believe in you and want you to move forward, but you need to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, it's hard for other people to give you um, what you can give yourself when it comes to belief. Believe in yourself. If you want to use me as a resource, and you should use me as a resource, and I hope you want to use me as a resource, as I am the college and career counselor, you can set up a one-on-one -on -one with me directly through Calendly. You'll see it at the bottom of all of my emails. All of the counselors at Round Lake High School are using Calendly for you to set up 30-minute Zoom sessions with us. It's just calendly.com backslash jbruno-5 backslash 30 minutes. Again, this will be sent to you, so that way you can just click this link. Sign up if you want to talk about the search process, application, specific college questions. After October 1st, if you have questions about FAFSA, reach out to me. I can get you in contact with other people if I'm not available specifically or I don't know an answer. Um, scholarship questions, fee waivers, transcript requests. You can even send me just an email saying, hey, Mr. Bruno, I need a fee waiver here. We can talk about it or a transcript or score. I'm here to help you, and I honestly and genuinely look forward to answering your questions. That's why I'm here. I'm here to help this process and make it easier for you, so use me as a resource. This is what it looks like when you go into my Calendly page. Uh, you would see all the blue lit up numbers. Those are dates that I'm available. 
click on a date. If you wanted to meet with me on the 30th of September, you would click the 30th. It would pop up next to it on the right with what times I'm available. When you make a con when you confirm, a link will come to you uh, with my Zoom link, and then I'll get a calendar request. You'll have a calendar request, and then we'll be able to meet with each other. If we were in person, I would ask you to ask questions, or if you had questions, we would answer them, but we are not in person. So what you can do is send an email directly to me, send an email directly to your counselor, set up a one-on-one -on -one with myself or your counselor, even though we are not here in person with you, we are here for you. We are here to make sure that if you have questions, we can find you answers. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you so much for listening to part two of this uh, presentation. Uh, there's going to be a lot more events coming up. Participate in everything. Everything you can participate in will make it a little bit easier for you in the future. Ask questions. Believe in yourself. You are a rock star. We are so proud of you. We're here if you need anything. Thank you so much. Bye.